And um, we welcome Joe Ochinski from the University of Miami, um, where he works at, as a professor of political science, um, uh, has completed his MA in political science at University of New Hampshire in 2003 and his PhD in political science at the University of Arizona in 2007. Studies um, public opinion and mass media and uh, of course with a focus on conspiracy theories and related misinformation. He's the co-author of the book American Conspiracy Theories, uh, same title as today's talk um, that's appeared with Oxford in 2014. And uh, he's the editor of Conspiracy Theories and the People Who Believe Them in uh, Oxford uh, 2018. And uh, most recently, um, this textbook, um, Conspiracy Theories, a primer. And um, yeah, so one of the experts on the topic. And it's an honor and a pleasure to have him here. Um, so I'll give you the floor. Um, <laughs> shoot away. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tobias, for inviting me, and thank you all for coming. It's it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so I got into the topic of conspiracy theories about twelve years ago. I wish I had a more romantic story about how that happened, um, but it, it's simply that a, a colleague of mine knocked on my door and said, "Hey, I have this idea to study conspiracy theories," and I said, "No, that's stupid." I said, no one cares about this topic. It's out on the fringes of political science. No one's studying this and no one cares about it. And he, he badgered me for about a week and eventually after the arm twisting, I, I agreed. And um, I guess that's my career now. Um, but it, what that story tells us is that at the time it was a very different environment for this topic than it is now. Um, at this point, we have hundreds of social scientists and hundreds of other uh, researchers across disciplines getting into the topic. Um, and it's become rather big and, 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 you know, thankfully rather vibrant too. Um, to put that in social perspective, when I started studying this topic, I set up a Google alert for the term conspiracy theory. So every evening I would get the number of stories in newspapers and blog posts that discussed conspiracy theory. And I was getting every night a listing of about four or five stories and none on the weekends. And this was around 2010. Around 2015, that number switched to uh, between 50 and 100 stories every night, every single day. And it hasn't let up. And that sort of tells you where, you know, where our attention has been focused for the last few years. You know, there is a perception that we are indeed in a post-truth world and um, journalists are covering that. And if, if you look around at the major news organizations, many of them have a team dedicated to covering conspiracy theories, misinformation, um, online um, information and whatnot. So it's a very different environment than it was a long, um, a long time ago. I would like to say that I knew in advance the topic was going to blow up, but I had no way of knowing. I can't take credit for that. Um, I think a lot of it really just had to do with two idiosyncratic things, and one was Brexit and the other being uh, Trump, which sort of laid the foundation. And then with the pandemic, all of a sudden, you know, this is one of the big topics out there. So the media has been talking a lot about conspiracy theories lately. So why don't we take a minute and look at what, what the media is saying about, about this topic. So the economist says conspiracy theories are surging from the Congo to the Capitol. Uh, Politico says we're now in the golden age of conspiracy theories. And the Washington Post is afraid that you might fall down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole. And this is the Washington Post, not Cosmo. Um, but regardless, you can take the quiz and find out if you are indeed a conspiracy theorist. Um, when it comes to COVID-19, a lot of coverage about th those conspiracy theories. Uh, we're afraid they're flooding social media. 
um, in keeping people from getting the vaccine. COVID conspiracy theories are tearing relationships apart. And our kids are being affected by uh, uh, COVID conspiracy theories too. Um, and we also have uh, the pandemic video, which supposedly last year was uh, turning everybody into a COVID conspiracy theorist. Um, and even though it started in 2017, um, the coverage of QAnon really went into high gear in 2020 after the pandemic started. And we wound up with uh, a lot of QAnon coverage and a lot of concerns, namely being QAnon is, is big, it's getting bigger, it's gone mainstream, it's far right, and what are we going to do about it? So the first thing that the media tends to do is uh, find a villain, and, and they, they clearly have, and it seems to be social media. So 9-11 conspiracy theories live on on social media. Um, if you trust social media, then you're more likely to be a conspiracy theorist. And of course, TikTok is turning our kids into conspiracy theorists. And this isn't The Onion, this is The Guardian. And this is the general tenor of the coverage out there, where we've essentially demonized these tech companies and turned them into um, <laughs> literal villains. <laughs> Um, so with all this coverage, the public is convinced. Uh, polls show that 70% of Americans believe that uh, conspiracy theories are now out of control. 60% uh, of Americans think that we believe conspiracy theories more than we did 25 years ago. And the vast majority of Americans blame social media and the internet for this state of affairs. So the media has gone beyond just blaming and is calling for restrictive policies. So it's time for Congress to hold these social media companies accountable. We need uh, laws to regulate information online um, and the companies clearly can't do it themselves. So Congress and the president must do it. Of course, there are serious policy implications with any such scheme. Um, which we should always have in the back of our mind. When you regulate tech, um, you're stifling innovation and, you know, and even though you may want to regulate monopolies, you may essentially be locking them in permanently. Um, when you try to regulate markets, you can increase costs and decrease choice. Um, but more importantly than that, um, regulating speech can have a serious chilling effect on what, on what people will say, and that can affect our overall uh, political dialogue. We've already seen collateral damage. I mean, the, the algorithms that, that are being asked to regulate um, what gets taken down on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, they're not always good at discerning what's true and what's false. That's not what they're designed to do. And sometimes they take down really valuable information um, because it addresses uh, sensitive topics. Um, but even worse, when you allow the government to step in and decide what's true and what's false and what should be banned and what shouldn't, um, eventually it's going to become manipulative, where governments are going to want to censor the things that make them look bad, um, true or not. And that's something we have to be most wary of. So the questions I want to ask in this talk are, are conspiracy theories on the rise? Uh, what about COVID-19 and QAnon conspiracy theories? Are those increasing? Um, particularly, are they increasing in response to social media? Are conspiracy theories driving behavior and violence? And is social media uh, responsible for this? So I'm going to define my terms. I'm going to talk about where these beliefs come from. And I'll test the media narrative and discuss what we might be getting wrong. So a conspiracy, um, and I'll keep these short because if you've been attending this talk, you've probably you're probably already familiar with with these definitions. But conspiracy is a small group of powerful people working in secret uh, for their own benefit against the common good and in a way that undermines our bedrock ground rules against the widespread use of force and fraud. And we know that a conspiracy happened because the appropriate uh, knowledge generating experts have determined that that's the case. So how do we know Watergate happened? 
because the FBI, Congress, the courts all investigated, and they put their findings out there for anyone to challenge if they wish to do so. Conspiracy theory has all the same elements. So again, it's, it's a small group working in secret uh, for their own benefit against the common good and in a way that undermines our bedrock ground rules against the widespread use of force and fraud. Uh, but in this case, the, no, the appropriate knowledge generating bodies have not determined that that particular allegation um, has happened. Doesn't mean it's false. It just means that the appropriate bodies haven't determined that it's that it's uh, most likely true. So if you think that the CIA or the mafia or some group other than Lee Harvey Oswald killed uh, Kennedy in 1963, then you're engaging in conspiracy theory. And again, this doesn't mean you're engaging in a falsehood. It just means that in this case, we call it a conspiracy theory because the, the appropriate bodies haven't said it's likely true. So why do people believe conspiracy theories? Well, the unsatisfying answer is probably the most accurate, and that is for lots of reasons. And the question really devolves into uh, why do people believe anything? It's the same answer for a whole lot of reasons. You know, when you ask people, why do you believe A, B, and C? They'll say, well, because those things are true. Well, it's not like pieces of information have shining qualities to them that say true or false and that people, you know, pick the true ones or pick the false ones anyway. Um, reality is confusing and people have to do the best they can with what they have to work with. And that means often relying on the tools that they, that they have. So uh, what are those tools? Well, first people have group attachments that drive how they interpret information. Um, so this comes in, in uh, uh, two main forms, and the first is motivated reasoning. People like to think that their group is good and virtuous, and it's the other group that's conspiring. So in my country, it's uh, Republicans think the Democrats are conspiring against them, and the Democrats think that the Republicans are conspiring against them. So we tend to point fingers in the other direction. Uh, the second is elite cues. People tend to listen to their, their trusted leaders. So when leaders transmit information and people trust those leaders, then they're going to adopt um, those, those pieces of information. So when Trump comes out and says COVID is, a, uh, is, is the Democrats' new hoax, then Republicans who pay attention to and listen to Trump are going to believe that COVID is indeed a new hoax. Um, the next thing is political circumstance can drive conspiracy theorizing too. So just to go back to Trump and COVID, um, when the pandemic hit in 2020, that was an election year. And everybody knew that with a pandemic hitting the US, that was most certainly going to injure the incumbent president's ability at reelection. So it was only natural that Republicans were going to downplay the effect of the pandemic political circumstance. And just the same, after any election, the losing side is almost always convinced, a certain amount of them anyway, um, that the winners rigged it against them. Uh, so in that sense, uh, political circumstance can drive who's believing in what conspiracy theories at what time. Uh, moving past group attachments, people have a series of dispositions that can drive how they interpret information. The one that I'm most concerned with is what I call conspiracy thinking. And this is a disposition that people have to one degree or another to view the world in conspiratorial terms. So you can imagine someone who has this disposition very strongly, they'll look out the window and to them events and circumstances are caused by conspiracies pulled off by people they don't like. And just the same, someone on the opposite end of that continuum um, we'll look out the window and say, well, consp conspiracies are probably the least likely explanation. And for them, it takes a lot of, of, of uh, evidence to convince them that a conspiracy is afoot. Um, next, our information environment can drive uh, what we think about the world. If the media is full of uh, talk of conspiracy at a particular time, that can drive belief in conspiracy theories. The 
uh, information being transmitted by our leaders can drive our beliefs and the people in our social circle can exert influence on us too. Also, in the case of some conspiracy theories, um, antisocial traits can drive these beliefs. Now, I don't want to make the case that antisocial traits drive belief in all conspiracy theories. I mean, over the last several decades, between 50 and 80 percent of Americans have believed that Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy. There's certainly nothing antisocial about that. It's a majority belief. Um, but if you believe that no one died at Sandy Hook or that the Holocaust was faked, um, what we tend to find in our research is that antisocial personality traits um, like higher levels of narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism tend to tend to correlate with those those particular beliefs. And finally, I want to point out too that conspiracy beliefs don't have to be transmitted. And I, and, I, and I think that there's been an overuse of the word spread in the last few years. It's not the case that, that conspiracy beliefs have to spread. People can make up whatever they want anytime for any reason. And in that sense, conspiracy theories are like fan fiction. There is no official version. You know, people with conspiratorial worldviews are going to believe whatever they want. And it doesn't have to be told to them by someone else. So, in short, those are sort of the reasons that drive belief. Um, so just to talk uh, just for a moment more about my conspiracy thinking construct. So these are the uh, measures, um, three of them anyway, that I, that I put on surveys to measure conspiracy thinking. So these are sort of bland statements trying to get under the hood. Um, because I don't want to measure belief in specific conspiracy theories with these, but just a general worldview. So these are our lives are being controlled by plots hatched in secret places, even though we're in a democracy, a few people always run things. Uh, the people who run the country are not known to the voters. So you could strongly agree or strongly disagree with these. It depends completely on your particular worldview. And what we find is that Americans uh, tend to fall into the neither agree nor disagree or agree. Um, but again, we have some variation running across here. Um, so from these questions, we can give all of our survey respondents a score. And what we find is that the people who get the high scores, the people who tend to strongly agree with these statements, tend to believe in lots and lots of conspiracy theories on our surveys. And the ones on the low end, the people who tend to strongly agree with these statements, believe in, in very few. So it's a rather predictive measure. So the basic model that I use to explain these beliefs is something like this, where information is sort of coming in all the time uh, to people's brains, that information is laid over the top of a bunch of dispositions that people have, their, their conspiracy thinking, their partisanship, their political ideology, their other group attachments, um, and that leads to particular beliefs. So people will accept or reject uh, conspiracy theories based on um, what's already inside of them, right? So two people can see the exact same tweet or Facebook post or be exposed to the same idea and come to very different conclusions about it because they're very different people. So to me, this leaves very little room for communication technologies to affect people. Because one, people's group attachments and dispositions and worldviews are driving them to self-select uh, much of the content that they're going to be exposed to, particularly online, where people create their own environments. And second, even if something does get through that people don't necessarily agree with, uh, people have the psychological filters to sort of ignore, explain away, or reason their way out of um, information that contradicts uh, what they already believe about the world. So um, a typical conversation that I will have with a reporter um, is something like this. Um, hey, Joe, there's this new conspiracy theory uh, going around on Twitter, and I'm concerned about it because um, everyone's going to see it and everyone's going to believe it. And I say, well, did you see it? And they say, yeah. And I say, so you must believe it then. And they say, no, I don't believe it. And I say, well, what makes you so special? What's your magic power that no one else has that you have? 
and then it dawns on them that perhaps you know people people believe what they want to believe and uh tweets and facebook posts and whatnot don't have magical powers to influence everyone in their path so let's ask a few empirical questions here so one um are americans believe in conspiracy theories more now than they did sometime in the past so the general media narrative that we've seen lately is that conspiracy theory beliefs are increasing and that social media use is the largest cause so if we were to test this the expectation would be something like this that beliefs in specific conspiracy theories at any given time would be greater than at any time previous and this sort of makes sense if these ideas are permeating social media and they're available and they're traveling so fast um, then people should be be uh, more likely to believe them as days go on so we should find that numerous individual conspiracy theories are believed more now than they ever were before um, and we should probably also find that people are exhibiting higher levels of general conspiracy thinking um, than they have in the past. So perhaps people are just becoming more conspiratorial. So let's start with two critical cases. The first is COVID and the other is QAnon. So in March of 2020, I happened to have a poll that was about to go out and that's when the pandemic hit. So I said, let's put two COVID conspiracy theories onto this poll. And we got it right out in the first few weeks of March of 2020. And the first question we asked was, is, is COVID being exaggerated to injure President Trump in the election year? And the second was, was COVID uh, purposely created and uh, spread in order to injure people? So this is sort of a bioweapon conception. So we got around 30% of Americans agreeing with each of those questions. But I followed up each of those again in June of 2020, October of 2020, and then for the bioweapon question in May of 2021. Um, for both questions, we found no increases over time. So as, as the lockdowns became worse and the economic conditions worsened and the lockdowns hit um, and it became a lot more scary, belief stayed incredibly stable. And the pandemic video, uh, which came out in, I think the mid spring was shared supposedly millions of times. And this was a big deal. And we said, oh, Facebook and Twitter have to take this down because it's gonna convince everyone. We, we were able to poll before this and after it came out and there was no changes in these, in these particular beliefs, which sort of capture what, what pandemic was, was arguing. Um, starting in June 2020, I polled on a bunch of other uh, COVID conspiracy theories and pieces of misinformation um, that coronavirus is being used to force a dangerous and unnecessary vaccine, uh, that Bill Gates is behind it, that we're going to get tracking devices in our bodies, uh, that hydroxychloroquine can prevent or cure COVID, that 5G causes it, and that you can spray yourself with Lysol to prevent or cure COVID. Um, None of those went up over time. Um, so we pulled them first in June 2020, then again a year later in 2021, and again, um, no increases, only, only minor decreases. So these beliefs were not constantly on the rise. Uh, moving on to QAnon, uh, the basic media claim throughout 2020 was that it was big and getting bigger, that it went mainstream, and that it's far right. Now, putting aside the logical problem here of how something can both be mainstream and far right or extreme at the same time, which doesn't really make any sense, um, let's see what the data shows. So in 2018, I started polling on QAnon. I started um, in Florida, um, but then moved nationwide with the polls. And I started asking people um, how um, how, uh, uh, how do you feel about the QAnon movement? And I said, rate it on a feeling thermometer from zero to 100, with 100 being you really like it and zero being you really hate it. So it came in around, a, uh, I think, a 23 on the first poll that we ran in Florida on average. Um, so that's not a stunning endorsement. And put into, just to put that into perspective, um, because that poll was done in Florida, I also put Fidel Castro 
on that same poll and asked Floridians to write him. If you know anything about Florida, you know we don't like Castro here. And when he died, everyone danced in the street. Um, and I think QAnon came a point ahead of, of Castro. So again, no, no stunning endorsement of QAnon. Since that time, um, whether we polled it again in Florida or polled it nationwide, um, support for QAnon never went up. And as more people started to know what it was, um, people seemed to like it even less. Um, so when we ran this in May of 2021, it came in around a 16. Um, when we asked a straight up question, are you a believer in QAnon, yes or no? Um, in 2019 nationwide, 5% um, of Americans said yes. Um, but breaking that down by party, it was 6% of Republicans and 6% of Democrats said yes. So again, no evidence that it's a far right conspiracy theory by any stretch. Repeated this poll two years later um, in the summer of 2021. And again, we got 6% saying yes, that are believers in QAnon, 7% of Democrats saying yes to 5% of Republicans. Again, it didn't grow over time. Um, by either of our measures, um, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence that it's appealing more to the right than the left. And just to put this in perspective, um, we got around 56% of Americans on the same poll in 2021 saying that they believed there was a conspiracy behind the Kennedy assassination. So Kennedy beliefs are mainstream. QAnon is, really isn't. Um, if we're talking about believing specifically in QAnon itself, the, you know, the group and the person posting is Q. And in fact, um, I think I've polled on around 50 or 60 conspiracy theories this year, and I think QAnon um, is the least believed um, of all of them that I poll on. Uh, so the media got this you know, pretty wrong. Um, so it was never big, it never grew. It was one of the least believed things I polled on. And um, having done further analysis on this, there's really no evidence that it's far right or even right. And I have a piece coming out in the Journal of Politics that uh, that sort of shows this. The factors driving belief in QAnon are not liberal conservative ideology or partisanship. It's more antagonisms towards the political establishment writ large, dark triad personality traits. Um, but it's not mainstream politics. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. It's not like uh, people are like, hey, I really like Ronald Reagan. And then I read Milton Friedman and I want really low taxes and hey, satanic baby eaters. It doesn't really follow along that way. Um, but I, I do wanna put a little bit of a caveat on this. So QAnon belief was never really big. But the ideas that QAnon adopted were always fairly popular. It's just that mainstream social scientists and journalists were always um, not really paying attention to those ideas. So when we poll on things like, is there a deep state? That's very popular. Um, but that doesn't make somebody QAnon. And, I did, and the popularity of the deep state goes back decades in this, in, in, in this country. Um, ideas about widespread child sex trafficking being run by Hollywood and political elites. That's very popular outside the people who say that they follow QAnon. And those beliefs probably long predate QAnon too. Um, you know, growing up in the 1980s, I mean, there was a massive satanic panic during that time. And there was a widespread belief that Satanists had taken over the schools and the churches and the police departments. And there was mass, you know, satanic ritual stuff being done to kids all over the place, which was a moral panic and none of it really turned out to be true. But those beliefs are still operating. And all Q really did was to sort of uh, take what's already out there and uh, dish it back in a new in a new way. So the good news is Q was never really big, um, but the ideas that Q um, trafficked in were big long before QAnon was. You know, so even the idea, and people think, oh my God, how could anyone believe that? The idea that a pedophile deep state is working against the president, um, I mean, that's, that's the plot of Oliver Stone's JFK movie, 
which came out in the early 90s. So nothing, nothing particularly new um, with that. So moving outside of those two critical cases, um, comparing the past to present, to present, this summer I polled on 37 other conspiracy theories. Um, so to do some of this, I repeated conspiracy theories I had polled on in recent years, uh, but for the Roper Public Opinion Database and looked up all the conspiracy theories that have been asked in polls going back several decades to the 1960s repolled them all with exact question wordings. Um, out of the 30 conspiracy theories, only six showed an overtime increase, ranging from four to 10 points. Um, 16 showed no change and 15 showed a decrease. And those decreases ranged from three to 30 points. Um, so the average change across all of these conspiracy theories, which spanned all sorts of topics and areas, uh, was about negative five percentage points. So again, no evidence of overtime increases in these. And if you were to just take Kennedy conspiracy theories, I mean, only a few weeks after the assassination, polls showed that 50% um, of Americans agreed with this, uh, with the conspiracy explanation. By 1970s, it went up to 80% of Americans and stayed that way for a few decades and only came down in the internet and social media era. Um, and I haven't seen anything hit 80% in any of the polls I've been doing, and I've been polling on a lot of conspiracy theories. Closest I get to um, is around 50%, um, and sometimes JFK hits that. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein uh, conspiracy theories hit around 50%, um, but the vast majority um, don't, don't even get close. Um, in terms of conspiracy thinking, this generalized worldview, has that gone up? Well, I've been polling on that since 2012, and the measure has been entirely flat <laughs> for the time I've been polling on it. So again, uh, we, we, hasn't, we haven't found that Americans have over time gotten more conspiratorial. So few increases in the social media era. Um, so if you're looking, if you start looking at, at, at a lot of the, the research that's coming out now, um, there's a lot of doubt being cast on some of these, some of the things that are getting talked about in the media. So um, these concerns about echo chambers, there's a lot of research saying, you know, there are echo chambers, but they're not quite that big. And a lot of people have sort of a, a media diet that's fairly diverse. Um, the idea of an infodemic saying that's not a very good metaphor and um, conspiracy theories just don't really spread in the way that a virus does. Um, the idea of post-truth, it's not clear that we're any less truthy than we were in the past. Maybe some of our political elites are, um, but that's not necessarily a mass phenomena. Uh, Self-selection tends to explain a lot of what's going on in terms of conspiracy theories and misinformation online, people opting in to this um, to this stuff rather than slipping on a banana peel and accidentally becoming a conspiracy theorist. Um, Russia did indeed, you know, put out a bunch of uh, misinformation and disinformation in the 2016 campaign, but it's not clear that it changed how anyone votes. And in fact, um, it, it seems to be the case that conspiracy theories and misinformation don't change other people's views that much. Instead, the conspiracy theories and beliefs and misinformation seem to be expressions of what's already what's already there, what people are already believing. Um, on top of that, we need to understand too. Um, in my country, at least, most people aren't paying attention to politics. Um, yeah, I think your median social media user likes puppy dogs and cats and things like that. They don't really care that much for the conspiracy theories and the. Um, they're not racing you know, to hear what Trump's saying. Um, and social media too overrepresents certain kinds of, of people who are opting in. So what you're getting in the media um, is, is, is a model that is incredibly, in terms of how media facts, you know, asserts a very strong role for media messages. Um, so, you know, often what you read in the media is something like this. You have normal folks, and then they go to the internet, and then they become this. 
and they see the conspiracy theories and misinformation, then, then they became deranged sociopaths. It doesn't really work that way. And if you, you read a little bit deeper, you often find that uh, people are who they are before they get to the, the internet. Um, so it really just, it, I'm doing some work right now on vaccine refusal, um, trying to figure out why are people refusing the vaccine. And there's a ton of studies, probably no less than 100 at this point, that have said, you know, we find a correlation between COVID uh, conspiracy beliefs and beliefs in COVID misinformation and vaccine refusal. Well, sure, that's a correlation, but it doesn't imply necessarily that those beliefs are driving the vaccine re refusal, right? Um, but this is the typical model that's implied in most of the coverage, is that you get exposed, you adopt the beliefs, you become hesitant, and then you refuse the vaccine. What I want to suggest is a model that's a little bit more complicated, but not much more complicated, in, in which case what I want to argue is that the beliefs um, in conspiracy theories and misinformation aren't really exogenous, but they're endogenous to people's psychological, political, and social motivations. So the same thing that's driving the vaccine refusal is also driving the beliefs in the misinformation and conspiracy theories, and it may even be the fact that people just aren't going to get the vaccine and they adopt the misinformation and conspiracy theories after the fact as a post hoc justification of what they were going to do anyway. So it may be the case that this might be the more accurate model. Um, so just to put a, a button on this, um, here's a, a study that I'm completing now where we're looking at uh, trying to explain beliefs in COVID conspiracy theories and misinformation. Um, and what we're finding is that traits that are generally longstanding are fairly predictive of these beliefs um, and that they're probably the product of elite queuing and these psychological tendencies. So um, the first thing we have there at the top is um, are people conflictual in their um, um, interpersonal relations? So we have the scale that goes from, you know, are you getting mad and yelling at people all the way up to stabbing and shooting them? Um, luckily, few people are stabbing and shooting people when they have disagreements. But um, what we do find is people who have rising levels of conflict when they have a disagreement, they tend to be more likely to believe in conspiracy theories and misinformation around COVID. People with higher levels of psychopathy, uh, people who have antagonisms towards the establishment writ large. and when I said um, elite queuing, people who very much like Trump also tend to believe the conspiracy theories and misinformation. Um, so a lot of the typical coverage we get out there is something like this, you know, QAnon is big and people are going on to uh, social media, they're getting sucked into QAnon, they're becoming big conspiracy theorists and then all of a sudden they are going out and doing crazy things like trashing the mask aisle at the local department store. Um, and it sort of puts the causal arrow from, oh, they went to social media, adopted these beliefs, then went out and acted, you know, in a deleterious way. Well, if you read down to page uh, 15, Sorry, I had to let the dog out. If you read down to page 15, all of a sudden you get uh, um, what might really be going on. And here is the, this woman that they said, oh, she trashed a, a, a mask aisle at Target. Well, she was um, in lockdown, in isolation. She had, had a diagnosed psychopathology. She wasn't on her medication. And she was incredibly stressed out because she just lost her job. So isn't that probably the bigger causal factor here than than simply seeing um, this content online. And, the, and, the, and it was probably this stuff that was driving both her to seek out that information and at the same time to act in deleterious ways. So what I want to suggest is that uh, um, tech panics abound. If you go back in time, you will find people complaining that society is going to fall apart because people are reading too many novels. Um, 40 years ago, was people watching too much TV, too many video games. Jazz is causing a new wave of suicide. Um, 
we need to ban the arcade games in town because it's creating a honky-tonk atmosphere. There's always something new that people want to blame for old social ills. Um, we need to be very, you know, very cautious of that um, because that's exactly what's happening now with these fears of social um, media. So, yes, indeed, COVID conspiracy theories are new and they're bad and we should do something about them, but they're only new in the sense that COVID is new. If you go back in time, COVID conspiracy theories were preceded by conspiracy theories about AIDS and swine flu and cancer and every other medical thing. Um, COVID vaccine conspiracy theories believed by the same people who believe conspiracy theories about MMR and other vaccines. The belief that Bill Gates is behind the pandemic simply replaces the conspiracy theories a few, you know, two years prior that George Soros was the bad guy controlling things. And before that, it was the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and every other rich family out there. Beliefs that 5G caused COVID. I mean, people were conspiracy theorizing about 5G before, before COVID hit. They were just saying it was doing different things. So all we really have here is the same people believing the same stuff with just different nouns in the sentences. So there's good and bad news out there. Um, which is what I want to leave you with. Uh, the good news is that the problem probably isn't getting worse. Um, the bad news is that the problem still exists. These beliefs are very widespread. Um, we have a lot to do to conquer them. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think another piece of bad news is that people are being very quick to have a panic over new technologies and to blame on short evidence on uh, new technologies for a problem um, that's, that is long standing and human. It's very easy to want to blame this exogenous force, those tech villains. You know, TikTok is doing it, or Facebook is doing it. It's much harder to look inward and say, this is us, and this is who we are, and we should try to be better humans, because um, nobody really wants to do that. Um, and with that, I will end it there, and thank you very much, and take any questions. Well, thanks a lot, Joe, um, for this clear talk and um, provocative claims, which I think I'm sure will raise many questions, but let me just quickly stop.